Welcome to the Startup Grind. زملائنا واصدقائنا في ستارت اب جرايند غزه اهلا وسهلا فيكم بنرجع لكم بعد طول انقطاع الفتره الماضيه يمكن بسبب كوفيد وبسبب الوضع العام اللي يمكن صعب في فلسطين وفي غزه وفي العالم حقيقه يمكن صار لنا فتره انقطاع وحبينا لما نرجع اليوم يكون عندنا ضيف كثير بهمكم وكثير الضيف هذا مهتم برضه في المشهد الريادي بفلسطين وبشكل او باخر هو برضه كان له علاقه في بعض التدخلات والانشطه اللي بتواجه مرض كوفيد وبرضه له خبره كثير واسعه في قطاع رياده الاعمال في كندا اليوم حنحكي مع جون انا حتركه يحكي عن نفسه اكثر ويمكن اللقاء حيكون باللغه الانجليزيه زي ما حكينا وان كان جون عنده مقدمه عن نفسه حيحكيها باللغه العربيه كان يعني نوع من مفاجاه او يعني هديه لاصدقائنا في ستارت اب جرايند برضه طبعا هذه الميتنج حتشوفوها مسجله على صفحه يوتيوب الخاصه بستارت اب جرايند تشابتر في غزه جون اهلا وسهلا فيك عرف لنا عن نفسك شوي مين هو جون هيدن؟ اهلا زميلي ورفيقي رافت اهلا اصدقائي في فلسطين في غزه انا اسمي جون هيدن انا كندي بسكن في مدينه صغيره هات تورونتو في انا انا عم بعمل في مركز التكنولوجيا مع وزاره الصناعة الكندية أنا بحب ستارت أبس وانتربرنورشيب وكل شيء عندي شركة اسمها جنرال سيفيليان درست في جامعة تورونتو والأمريكية في بيروت حيث حصلت ماجستير بالعلوم السياسية والتاريخ اللي سنتين في لبنان وثلاث شهور ممكن في الضفة الغربية في فلسطين زرت زرت رام الله ودرست بجامعة بيرزيت أستاذي هناك اسمه سامي شعث من خان يونس ألو سامي بدي أرجع إلى العالم العربي ممكن في المستقبل إن شاء الله وكمان إشي واحد أنا مع فلسطين أنا مع الفلسطينيين أنا ضاد الاحتلال و أم... و أنا أنا بفهم شوي الوضع هناك وبس عم بشوف اكستريم انتربرنور شيب و ألف ألف مبروك يا زملائي الأعزاء مية بالمية ممتاز آه، ولازم ممكن كمل لازم كمل باللغة الإنجليزية يا رفات آه، أكيد يعني هذا مقدم كتير كتير رائع وممتاز ويعني شكرا it's, it's, جزيلا it's... Thank you for for the efforts, uh, putting uh, up the effort. Uh, as I've just uh, said uh, under the air, I, I think your Arabic is is better than my English, but I think it's it's <laughs> well, it's really Arabic. good. <laughs> Thank you so much. I tried. I I figured like I'd give it a shot, and uh, yeah. No, I'm just yeah. really honored to be here with all of you today to talk about entrepreneurship, especially extreme entrepreneurship. Sure. And, uh, sure. But happy to to share my experiences and hopefully have a great conversation. As we always sure. do, Rafat. Definitely, definitely, and we've uh, had like a lot of talks that have led to this moment, and hopefully, yes. this will continue on afterwards. Uh, just a quick board, uh, a quick comment. أصدقائنا حيكون في الوصف والبعض الملخصات باللغة العربية تحت الفيديو. لا أهم النقاط اللي بنحكيها باللغة الإنجليزية لو حدا فاتوا أي شيء ولو في شيء أنتم حابين تتعرفوا عليه أكثر طبعا تقدروا تتواصلوا معنا بشكل مباشر. So uh, yeah basically John um, one of the things that you've just mentioned more, more than once is extreme entrepreneurship. So what's what's extreme entrepreneurship? Can you give, yeah. give us an idea about it? Yeah I think I think uh, yeah this is really interesting the question of like the theory of entrepreneurship like what what role does it play in society and politics and economics and and what makes it different from like other forms of business for example like i i tend to think that um 
like entrepreneurship is really an intrinsically uh, humanistic creative impulse. It's the desire that we have as human beings to uh, make a better world, to um, solve big problems, to do that in an, a way that is ingenious and novel and, uh, and in that sense has the potential to fundamentally like change uh, the state of affairs, the status quo, um, to change institutions, to change uh, the way things are done. So I think it's that creative destructive impulse, if you will, or that potential to overturn uh, the status quo that entrepreneurs have. And really like, I think often we, we talk about entrepreneurship, but we're really talking about the form of entrepreneurship, which is what happens later on once a venture begins, once a project begins, but what structure does it take? Um, and I think the structure given our mode of production, which is capitalism, unless you're following Yanis Varoufakis and other like heterodox economists, maybe we're living actually in an age of techno feudalism, uh, we've reverted perhaps, but in an, but if we, if we take the, the standard, you know, form of capitalism, then we're talking about like share capital corporations. We're talking about for-profit corporate, um, uh, entities. And once that happens, and once we set on a, on a process of developing a pro a project that is innovative and entrepreneurial into, um, company formation and then scale up, that becomes a different thing. So I think in terms of extreme entrepreneurship, uh, part of that defi definition for me is that when that process occurs in, in, let's say in North America or in Europe or, or in, 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 let's say other post-industrial, uh, contexts, it's hard enough. I mean, statistics vary, but we're talking about anywhere from you know two thirds to 90% of technology startups fail. So this isn't an easy thing. It's something that is extremely difficult. The time, the resources, the passion, the dedication, the, 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 that, it, that um, is required to see this kind of thing through without any guarantee of being successful. It's hard enough when everything is set up in your favor, you know, when there is like cultural support and there is government early stage support for for startups from government there's funding there's a thriving angel investor in, in venture capital sector like when when you have all of that and, and and you've got uh um like really every you know every advantage it's still extremely difficult so then when you take entrepreneurship and you put it into the context of a place like gaza like under occupation like then it becomes, it takes it to the next level. I mean, when you have, um, you know, uh, the, the, the situation and the barriers that you face, to have the, the dauntless, intrepid, amazing, like desire to form, form um, a startup in Palestine is like even, even more impressive and even more against the odds. And I think like that commands a lot of respect because if you can build a successful company in the forge of, the conditions that you face, then, I mean, that's just such a huge accomplishment. And I think that more, um, more people need to take notice of what's happening in Palestine and, and in other, other places around the world that we don't think of as traditional, um, you know, startup locales and say like, to do this and what can we learn from them? Sure, sure, agreed. I mean, I mean, uh, it's it's really interesting, and uh, that drives me to so many questions. But I don't want to lose track. Actually, I want to keep that a little bit later. So sure. we'll just go back one step. Uh, I'll go. I'll yes. go back to to John. I'll go back to you, John. Um, can you just tell us a little bit more about? I mean, uh, what's what what speciality did you study? Why did you come interested in the region, and and, and why did you come here to you know to further your studies in AOB and in Birzeit? And and what's the reason behind your interest in the entrepreneurship wise speaking yeah. in the entrepreneurial ecosystem in in the region? Oh sure, yeah, I could tie that all together pretty quickly. Um, yeah, so first of all, I mean, I don't have family in the region, like it's not a matter of like, oh, my mom's side of the family is Lebanese and I wanted to go to Lebanon. I, actually, I was studying like history and political science at the University of Toronto for my undergraduate. And I just happened to take some classes in like the modern history of the Middle East and Canadian foreign relations in the Middle East, etc. And I had just some amazing professors, like absolutely amazing. Um, Jens Hansen, uh, Amir Hassanpour, for example. 
And they were just so fantastic. I ended up randomly just taking more classes with that regional area focus, if you will. And, uh, and then I ended up doing some research into uh, mid-century uh, politics and foreign relations. Um, so an international relations kind of perspective on, on uh, the Middle East and specifically like Bilad Hashem and Palestine and so forth. So I thought, hey, if I, I wanted to do my master's and I thought what better place to do it than at AUB um, so that I'd be embedded in the region. And I, I was actually doing some research on diplomatic history of some, some Palestinian diplomats that had made uh, presentations to the uh, Standing Committee on External Affairs in Canada just in the years leading up to the 1948 war. And it was really fascinating because I didn't know who they were and there was no real account of them in the official histories, like in the textbooks. So I ended up like just, that became a departure point for um, some of my research. And uh, it took me to, uh, to Jordan, to Amman, um, and I actually met the family of this, this Palestinian diplomat from the, the archival record. And that was the beginning of uh, some research. And of course, I just I did like a general political science kind of a, a degree, and um, it was wonderful. I had an amazing experience. I loved being in Beirut. It's like just a wonderful city, and it's gone through and continues to go through so much. And that's a story for a discussion for another day. But um, and then after when I graduated, actually, I I just I ended up working for this organization that's supported by the federal government to encourage entrepreneurship and help accelerate early stage companies. And I loved it and I ended up taking, um, I did like the exec education program at MIT at the Sloan School. I did the entrepreneurship development program in 2013 and loved it. You know, and got it, got involved in events like this, like Startup Grind and Startup Weekend and so forth. And, you know, we can talk a bit about like the experience I've had in startups um, as well as helping them and accelerating them. But that that's sort of like how I got into it. And then I was even part of a very small part, but an ambassador. Safir for uh, Dumal, which was like uh, the general crowdfunding website for in Arabic language for the Middle East, which was founded by uh, another AUB grad. And I uh, was involved in that early on, just in a very minor role. But that it, it just got me really, it opened my eyes to see how powerful the potential of entrepreneurship was in the Middle East, that it was un. un it was it was unrealized that potential and continues to be unrealized for many many reasons historical colonial um, but also you know um, given pl current political situations and given constraints like you know the lack of uh, legal structure for um, venture capital and other things but uh, again you know I, I just think there's so much interesting happening and with Riable you 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 really have a a touch point on that which is incredible um, I've been to other countries. Um, like in, in in North Africa and the Middle East as well. And I just see that potential everywhere. And really the sky's the limit and so many great things that I think are going to happen over the next decade or two. So I hope to be in some way a part of that or at least being a champion for it. Definitely, my friend. And I believe you're you're making a big difference through what you're like uh, saying and or also more more even from what you're doing. Um I'd like also to touch a little bit on what you're doing, actually. Uh, sure. So, can you you said you've been involved with with Dumal, and from your introduction, mm. you've been involved with a little bit of over like a handful of startups in the region. So, uh, just just a quick thought on that. Like, what what was your experience with uh, you know as somebody from from Canada working with a startup overseas towards you know. A, Mostly, I, I, I'd consider your your efforts within like a social entrepreneurship perspective rather than like a business oriented perspective. So, so what was your experience like? I mean, did you find it fruitful? Did you find it not so much? Oh no, uh, yeah, it, it's 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 awesome. I I think like we can become so myopic like in our national context or in our own communities where we grew up or where we were raised and. Um, I feel like that comparative perspective alone is so valuable just to see how other people do it. You know, um, I think that's important to free yourself of, uh, you know, the, the, the way that you can sort of, um, only look at what's around you and you need to expand your horizons and there's a whole world out there and, and, and amazing opportunities, amazing people. And that's just edifying and awesome in, in, in and of itself. But 
I don't know. Like I give an example. Like a couple years ago, I got to visit um, Université Mohammed VI Polytechnique in uh, just like north of Marrakech in uh, Morocco, uh, Fil Maghreb, and yep. like this is just to me. I feel like this is symbolic of what's happening in in Mina in the Middle East, North Africa region. This is like a brand new polytechnic institute it's beautiful it's like ultra modern it has amazing technology there's an in gathering of the diaspora so like all of these uh second and third generation you know moroccan um uh, uh professors and scientists and entrepreneurs like they're all sort of like they're coming back from europe and north america and abroad and 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 really like galvanizing around this project to build like um uh, an institution that's going to be focused on technology and innovation and entrepreneurship and and be sort of like a, a place not just for Moroccans, uh, but also for all of Africa and to be like really connected into uh, African uh, economic advancement and scientific adv advancement, which I think is a great mission. And the people there are just amazing and like and really be, I, they're different because it's Morocco, but I felt like there was a very similar like culture of creativity and sort of like the art part of steam like their science technology art engineering and mathematics right and and uh i, I felt like the, that way in beirut like the design sensibility of the lebanese like their artistic and creative like capacities like and i felt like there's like a similar like culture there in in morocco and uh but i got to like you know meet with the people that, that founded that center um the impulse accelerator which is really like similar to what you and I do in, in our work, which is supporting and advancing entrepreneurship and incubating companies and connecting, matching them up with investors and so on. And like one of the big puzzle pieces that hasn't been solved yet is uh, like how to mobilize risk capital, like that early stage capital to support entrepreneurs and how to structure those companies. It's like an unsettled legal question um, relative to, um, you know, debt versus equity and, so forth, right? Um, so, so you say, well, look at all these amazing companies coming from all over Africa, like drone agriculture and like uh, you know on-demand, uh, you know, uh, services and SaaS and uh, clean tech and you know materials science and like it's everything, the whole gamut from social to deep tech and uh, like there's so much opportunity ahead, and it's that feeling of um, being in a country where the future might look better than the past. And for a lot of people here in North America, we haven't felt that in a long time, right? Or like I, I certainly haven't. I've always felt like we're in a post-industrial phase of stagflation and decline <laughs> over, over the long term, honestly. And then we fight a rear guard action to continue to support innovation and entrepreneurship. But I feel like in Morocco and other places like it, um, it can be a real, it's just like an engine that's humming and, and it might be creating value and opportunities that, that mean that the quality of life and the standard of living and, and so on in the future, it might be better than it is today. And you see it in infrastructure projects, in um, digital infrastructure and digital transformation, in huge like solar geothermal installations and like ultra modern architecture and like, it, it's it's just so cool to see that happening, and you could the, the the energy, the social energy is very palpable, and that's not to discount any of the political like dimensions of this question, the equality of development and so forth, and um, there's so much to talk about there. But also, like one last thing is that I feel like there's an unreal unrealized unre potential in solidarity that is pan Arab solidarity to support each other in this development. It's really unrealized. Like when I was in uh, Morocco, just quickly, the, you know, there was the um, Bahrain conferences, you know, for the right. that, you know, Jared Kushner, like organized, yep. what have you. It was quite appalling. And uh, when I was there, like people were like pouring out into the streets to demonstrate for Palestine. And they did that, you know, frankly, uh, with full well knowing what might happen in terms of the suppression of that crowd by the authorities. I mean, it's not easy to do that. And we know because of normalization of relations that that situation in that country has changed. But like there's huge love and support and solidarity with the people of Palestine. 
And that was something that was very obvious and real historically, which I know from reading the history of the region. But what that should con can and should continue. And people like you and I, we need to be connectors and catalysts and help to make more connections so that there are real connections between people and that we can, you know, um, if we have to, we uh, have to, like, you know, um, short circuit all of the ways that that's being uh, suppressed or repressed or blocked and, and, and really make it happen. So I feel like huge potential, huge opportunity. And it's that feeling of excitement and, 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 and growth and, and the potential for uh, really amazing things to happen that has been very rewarding for me in terms of connections with the Middle East and North Africa. Definitely, definitely. I mean, thanks for that insight. Uh, definitely useful. Uh, moving on, uh, because time is really running fast. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I would love to hear a little bit about the general civilian. I mean, I've sure. seen you very active on LinkedIn. I believe you you do like some work like to to counter COVID uh, using the different technologies. W what do you do exactly? Yeah, so so we had a we had a startup last year where um, I was working with some of our local engineers and injection molding manufacturers, advanced manufacturers, and we had done like a civilian production uh, effort that was sort of the de distributed, decentralized. Where early in the pandemic we were producing PPE when it wasn't available on the market, so the commercial supply lines had been interrupted, and so we got used to working together. And this was in a in a volunteer capacity; it was just uh, a way to support the community. Um, people rallied to do that. But but by working together, we created this impromptu sort of engineering group um, that was looking at adapting uh, respirator and mask designs for the new reality of COVID. So it was an example of like an effort to, to sort of bring that consortium together and lead that uh, project to develop like a, a, a reusable um, face mask that really was an intermediate category between a mask and a respirator. Um, using advanced materials, filters, um, you, you know, incorporating reusability so to limit environmental waste and just like improve on the design and get something out there that would be made in Canada. So locally made, locally manufactured, uh, rather than relying on, you know, uh, you know, global supply chains, for example, from China. So, so that, that was the purpose of that project. And it's been really interesting because like, starting a startup in the middle of a pandemic, a global crisis is kind of an interesting time to start. And really it's, uh, it's been w really interesting. Uh, we're in like the sort of early commercialization phase. We had some really good early traction and we're doing the final um, uh, certification uh, on the regulatory front to certify our, our uh, product with the Canadian equivalent of N95, which is the NIOSH standard. And that's also been challenging. And it's a reminder for when you're devising your strategy for your startup, you really have to consider like the legal and regulatory framework and the state of the industry and so on, because these place fundamental constraints and on what kind of uh, go-to-market strategy you can have. And that can all, all often be frustrating, particularly when there's the urgency of an emergency, right? Yeah, so, yeah, definitely. yeah. Definitely. So, I mean, I mean, stemming from that uh, point of view, I believe you're doing a great job. Uh, I, I may know the answer, but I, I would love to take your take on it. Do you think that COVID has, with the pandemic and the problems and the disaster, has created opportunities for startups like in Palestine, for example, like lots of people are like losing jobs and uh, lots of startups are actually losing hope and moving maybe for freelancing and, you know, online work to 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 help themselves survive so so is there really a, an opportunity to to within these tough times for entrepreneurship in tough areas like in palestine and in gaza yeah definitely i mean it's 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 kind of hard i'm reluctant to talk about the pandemic as an opportunity because it sort of sounds kind of crass but i think you like you explained it well like people like really this is a matter of necessity first of all and disruption and necessity or something like this um so yes, I think that there is opportunity. Um, I think you 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 hit on something though. Um, I think it's important, and I meant to. I wanted to bring this up today because I usually talk about it when I do a talk. I do like an annual, actually twice a year. I do a a talk at our local um, institute of technology, the Ontario, Tech, the Ontario Tech University. Um, I talked to like undergrad engineers and I try to dis help them distinguish the taxonomy of, of business. Like 
to me, a startup is different than a small business, which is different than a freelancer, even though they might all be technologically enabled. So it's not really necessarily just the technology aspect, but it's really like how they operate, how they're structured, how they grow, what kind of capital they raise, um, what kind of growth uh, profile they have and so on. So whether they have tradable or non-tradable jobs. So for example, um, I think on the, on the startup side, so on the startup side, I think there's some interesting opportunities and uh, we, we already see like a nucleus of Palestinian startups that are, that have already like blazed that trail. So we should have more of them. Um, but, you know, a startup has certain, like a certain, certain requirements. It's actually much easier to think of becoming a freelancer, like, you know, uh, telecommuting or working remotely as a distributed team. Like that's because like, since that we can so quickly upskill online with uh, online learning with ed tech, um, you can quickly become very valuable, more valuable than like even a recent grad of a software engineering like program. Um, you can develop skills that are really needed uh, internationally within you know um, the technology sector, uh, and you can get something going. And I think that where people are doing that, Rafat, that's a good thing. Um, I th I'm sure it's opening up huge doors and increasing like uh, earning potential. And uh, but that that but that is that self-employed freelance thing is is an economic opportunity, but it's not a startup like in the classical sense like a startup is sure. has like ip or a technology uh based competitive advantage it's like it represents a categorical shift of some kind in in the product or process it's innovative it raises venture capital like it takes many years to get out of pre-revenue phase and into commercialization and usually uh it, it needs to not though no not it not exclusively it's raising venture capital which is a specific form of finance and its growth profile, its scale, scalar growth profile is like a growth curve, right? Um, so those dynamics aren't in place for a freelancer, but a freelancer might be working for a startup or an established company like a SaaS company or what have you. So Definitely, definitely. I uh, love that talk. I mean, speaking of uh, venture capital, I believe you're also part of a group uh, interested in, uh, in making venture investments um maybe one of the most asked questions in palestine and mainly in, in gaza that there's huge lack or absence mm -hmm. of uh you know uh, risk-taking uh, venture capital fund uh, for the obvious reason of you know uh, highly risky environment not many investors are willing to invest money in in, in fragile environments and uh, mm -hmm. as we all know uh, the capital is is always uh uh, you know, uh, risk averse, like the investors just want to go where like it's safe. But today, maybe COVID has changed this, you know, uh, theory that everybody is is not safe. Like people who like used to have like safe jobs are like leaving their jobs and people who used to do things one way are like starting to think of other ways. Um, also, I want to connect this with the thing that you've mentioned about the region, maybe also having the startup in Palestine, I, I would take the example here, and that would also go for for other uh, countries in the MENA region. Uh, maybe in 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 the West, it's like in in Canada, in the US, and and else in Europe, it's providing something nice to have and making life easier for people. That's that's the uh, the the thing for for innovation. But here, mm -hmm. it may be making it possible to live, like preventing somebody from you know, going abroad and living elsewhere and leaving their country, like mm -hmm. giving the means for people to survive. So so it's really a question of, uh, rather than like having like a social impact or a business impact. Sometimes it's really a question of of, of making empowering people in, in, in their lands and in their communities. Uh, how can Palestinian entrepreneurs or like, let's say I'm, I'm having a startup and like I'm having this, this good idea and a good team that we're working on some tech uh, solution. How can we convince these investors, like, just take a look at us, like, uh, just consider our proposal, just consider that we have a value to add. Maybe we don't have like a million dollar business that will 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 bring in dividends within a year, but we'll definitely are bringing value to millions of people. So, so, so what's your take on that, especially for markets with high risk uh, tolerance? Huh? Yeah, I mean, 
for an early stage company that's pre-revenue, it's always difficult to land a, a meeting with a VC. I mean, even the early stage VC funds, like they, they're looking for really high ARR, like annual recurring revenue. Like they, they're, are they really looking at you at this stage? I mean, it's really more of a question of angel investing. And really, like you said, social finance is much more of an opportunity here, like social impact funds, um, broadly speaking. Uh, like in Canada, there's a lot of like non-dilutive early stage funding for technolo new technology companies. Like a lot of people would say not enough, but um, it's there. Uh, so I would think that, I think that less restrictive capital is, is really the way to go here. Um, less extractive, less restrictive, less dilutive. Um, because really just having these companies in Palestine is, is key. I mean, you want as many of them, I think you want as many of them as you could possibly have. Um, now on the question of like retaining those firms, like that's, that's a, generic problem of all regions like including ours like we're we're in in ontario you've got the kitchener waterloo toronto corridor it's a very advanced like system for venture capital and technology entrepreneurship and outside of that you have other regions like trying to get there but kind of not being as competitive and when they offer incentives or have regional funds then they can often be in a situation where you you you're you're fighting to retain companies that later want to move to these more uh developed uh or or opportunity dense uh, regions and leave. Even as hard as it is to leave Palestine, people do. Uh, once they, you know, uh, get to a certain level, um, it can happen. And you want, and you know, but that's a problem. Every incidentally, every region faces, except maybe, and maybe even Silicon Valley is facing currently. You know, maybe people are jetting off to Miami now or what have you. So, right? Um, Definitely. Yeah. So, so I would say. Uh, and again, on the structure side, like, you know, I think we need to look at alternative structures. Like, why can't a uh, technology startup be a cooperative? And uh, there's other ways to raise capital as a cooperative or, you know, even as a for-profit corp corp corporation, you know, venture capital isn't the only way. And then finally, I would say to answer that, some VCs actually have extreme entrepreneurship as an investment thesis, right? So you look for those those funds. like. For example, there's a there's a, a fund here in Toronto called uh, Extreme Venture Partners (EVP), and it's like their investment thesis that they like to invest in places that are unstable and you know economically challenged, and they do that investing internationally. So I think put those people on your uh, short list and uh, appeal to them first. But also angels, people that are serial entrepreneurs that have that are part of your community, that are connected, maybe through the the diaspora, for example. And uh, they, like even as a private friends and family round kind of thing, or like an early stage round, early round, maybe you can involve them. Um, and and they, they just wanna, they just wanna be a part of like helping the next generation uh, uh, achieve what they were able to achieve and they may be embedded with your company and so forth. So yeah, I think you just need to, you can't just assume that these big like na household name brand funds are gonna like give you a meeting. That's for sure. Right, definitely, definitely. Uh, we also have a question from for, uh, from Scott. Thanks, Scott, for that. We'll we'll just return oh, yeah. to bit a little bit later. Uh, but uh, I want to follow on uh, this line of thought, actually, John. Uh, like uh, we once once again, last time we spoke, we we did talk about like you know this uh, freelance versus entrepreneurship phenomenon, like. Uh, as you've mentioned, like it's it's not easy to get that venture investment, and lots of people are, are are like having difficulty maybe in selling their like products or services in tough environments. Sure. And given and given, of course, like uh, additional barriers maybe in the Palestinian market or even in the MENA region or even in in Canada or elsewhere, uh, lots of people are like considering the alternative of like, okay, I have this, I have skills personally, like I'm a good developer, designer, mm -hmm. I don't know mm -hmm. what. I can easily go online and and go as as a freelancer. Like, what's what's your view on that? I mean, is it is it something good for for economic empowerment? Speaking on like a community wise or or good beneficial for the ecosystem, or should they stay in for the long run and 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 and, and uh, you know uh, undergo the fight of of you know the startup fight? Hmm. Well, I mean, the startup fight is like 
the hardest thing you could do. So that's the most you could expect from people in a way. Like I can't, I couldn't advise people to do it. I mean, in the sense that you must, you have to have this unerring conviction and passion and like, it almost has to be an imperative and you're going to do it no matter what. And it doesn't matter what I say. Right. So I think if you're, if you're cautious and conservative and, you know, thinking like what, what's the best path for me, you probably answered the question. It's probably, it's, it may probably isn't entrepreneurship, but it might be freelancing. I don't think that there's anything wrong with it in, in the, in specifically in your context, because I think that you've got increased like professional development opportunities, wage earning potentials, skills development, all of that. Like, I think it's mostly gains, but the thing is, it is at the end, at the end of the day, a contract, a contractor relationship, you know, it's like a, you know, it could be contract employment or it could just be, it's more likely contract is crowd, crowd sort of crowdsourced um, work. And really the, the, the economics of that are bad because they're, it's always pushing the, the compensation down to the minimum, you know, um, that being said, back to the question of COVID and opportunities. I mean, COVID-19 has spurred a massive like wave of digital transformation of established SMEs, like small, medium-sized enterprises that have put off the question of end-to-end -end workflow solutions and building efficiencies and, you know, building up their digital pres presence and all of that. And, and that kind of infrastructure that goes along with it, it needs people that can jump in and, and be really effective in that short-term contract sense, probably. Um, so that's an opportunity, like there's no question. And because it's technologically focused, it's going to contribute to, you know, uh, human and economic advancement, I would think it would, it's the pro I, I guess like one problem I see is like that I, I had mentioned before to you is that I feel like there's, there, there's, there's too much of a focus on digital and social and not enough on deep tech because like, for example, I'm a member of like the Beers Aid alum, alumni group and I see like, you know, like, like another, I, I see it with all other universities across Palestine of which there are many. It's why there are so many PhDs and there's so many like schools in Palestine because there's a lot more going on than just like um, e-commerce, you know, like whether it's agricultural sciences, material sciences, advances in like basic advances in physics and um you know, chemistry and so forth. Like another big opportunity I see for the coming cycle decade or couple decade cycle would be in clean tech, um, clean technologies. And, and are we thinking about that? Or are we just saying like, how can we, you know, be a contract front end developer for a, you know, a SaaS startup like that? That's good. And there's nothing wrong with it, but is that what I, I have a feel, my sense is like, that's what most people are doing. And, and I think, what what can we do to be more broad based and thinking about technology um, in terms of other areas and, and including like hardware and physical technologies and and clean tech or green tech in particular? Definitely, I mean, thanks for that valuable insight. I really be I agree with you, and 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 I think that this is maybe the way forward for at least entrepreneurs to think, uh, youth to think, graduates to think, and we have like lots of those following our chapter and they usually come for us for advice and, and we like, you know, well, is like, is there an opportunity to get funding? Is there an opportunity mm. to, you know, get incubation? Otherwise we'll just go the easy way. So it's, it's really up to the person. I, I totally agree with you 100%. Well, what, what, do you, what do you think, Rafat, about like organizations like Ibtikar and there are venture funds in uh, Palestine and our, how, what what's the access to capital gap like right now? Like, so when people ask about funding, like what, what what's the, uh, is there a local circuit? Is there an international circuit that, that, that you know is, is reasonable and where there's like a decent shot at getting investment? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, th th there are a few uh, VC funds in the West Bank, actually, based mm. in the West Bank. Uh, they've made a, a few investments over the past few years. They've gone a little bit under the radar over the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. um, sadly, most of the investments were not as successful as they have hoped. Most of the investments were like basically in, in the West Bank, with a few investments actually made in Gaza. The access to those funds from Gaza is is fairly restricted via, you know, you have to be accelerated under like a certain accredited incubator or accelerator that they have mm -hmm. to vet you for 
to for the fund and if they vet you correctly and if the fund is, is interested you get this this investment but uh, sadly mo most of the investments have gone like uh, unsuccessful while others that were not in invested in like uh, I, I could name you like numerous examples were actually mm -hmm. a success so it's really mm -hmm. um you know i i also think like as the entrepreneurship in uh, ecosystem in palestine is still building up so is the investing scene in, in palestine yes. like even investors are learning as they are going and uh, hopefully more investment funds uh, it's focused on like you know the the Palestinian needs and 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 the ones of the actual local market and demand because mostly these these VC funds are driven by the demand from abroad. Like most of the investments were done mm -hmm. for startups that like used to virtually serve people overseas. Like if there's like a mm -hmm. different perspective, that would definitely prove beneficial in the like a community uh, from my point of view. But uh, I'd like to follow up on on the questions actually now. Uh, Scott uh, has yeah. mentioned um, a quick question just to cut it short, like regarding the COVID and you know with the difficulties for startups are 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 facing. Like, do you think that these areas uh, position entrepreneurs to build ideas with greater impact? And what's your thoughts on social impact investing at the moment? Yeah, I mean, I, I think probably the most hopeful thing about COVID would be spurring global cooperation, right? So um, in that respect, I think we're, we're in a more connected world. We're in a more digital world. Uh, so I think that there has to be more opportunity um, for startups to uh, be able to make a difference internationally, even if they're, they're starting up in Palestine. Uh, and then in terms of social impact funds, I think there's got to be a reset on this question. And I like the idea of alternative structures, one, because already we're facing this problem of like how to raise venture capital in the Middle East because you can't have equity in most jurisdictions, really. And companies are, you know, uh, registering in Delaware. It's like, how do you how do you be a Palestinian startup that holds IP and raises venture capital? I mean, like you're not going to go to the securities and exchange the Palestinian uh, version of the SEC or whatever, right? Like, and um, you are going to have trouble, like even structuring a traditional like VC round, right? Um, and then debt isn't like debt isn't really a preferable for like pre-revenue stage companies. And then so then what else could we do? Well, there's a lot we could do, but I I'd like to see what we do be um, unrestricted. So I like the idea. Maybe you want to have more public funds that are um, matching private investment, for example, with uh, non-dilutive, non-repayable contributions like grants. So maybe there's more grants and, and uh, or maybe there's just more investing on, on the upside, but without the control. And, uh, and, and I think like, you know, maybe it's idealistic, but we have to like, we have to recognize that like that there are other barriers that have to be removed. But in any case, like, uh, like I, I don't want to see more phil philanthropy and dependency and we don't want perverse outcomes where like companies that don't have potential are funded. I mean, that's not, that's not going to help. That's also not obviously um, healthy, if you will. So I recognize that, but on the same side, we could err on the side of, you know, uh, liberality here and, and, and really like try to launch as many ships as we can. I mean, why, why would, why wouldn't we, uh, you know, and, and there needs to be a cultural shift in the region away from the cautious conservative investing that you talked about. Uh, but, you know, I think it's a pathway of renewal and revitalization and we can make the case. But I think you're, you're, you're seeing certainly in like the Euro-American context, if you will, um, more of this social finance, social impact investing. I think it's just going to get bigger and bigger because it's part of the, the whole shift to like sustainability and responsibility and so forth because people are realizing that our traditional systems are not sustainable and are um, can be oppressive and unfair and destructive. So there's got to be a correction. And is this piecemeal reform or is it fundamental? I don't know, but we probably need more social impact funds uh, for entrepreneurship in, in um, Palestine, I would say. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Uh, and I think that another quick question that we've got under the air uh, from one of the, our friends. Uh, sure. I know you, you've, you've uh, touched on the areas that you think are like uh, promising areas like clean tech, but the question is really about like that as entrepreneurs in, 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 in Palestine, in Gaza and here, 
within the barriers that we are facing? What are the skills um, channels that they should be utilizing to really become, you know, a global, you know, startup, like actually reach yeah. audiences as much as possible. Like if somebody is not just starting out, like they're well in their like process and they do have like clients and they're, they're moving well and they have like a, a good number of, of employees, but they're still maybe facing difficulty in actually making this leap of faith towards, mm -hmm. you know, appealing to more audiences overseas, like, as somebody who has experience in working in different contexts, what what do you say to them? <laughs> I'm a, I, I'm actually not sure. Like I don't think. I mean, generally, this is the problem with entrepreneurship. It's not a science. I mean, if it was a science and there was a manual, we'd all be rich. Like we'd all be successful. Everything would be easily done and laid out. And but then that wouldn't make sense either because not everyone could be successful at once. So, like, so I I'd say first of all, like I, I can't tell you what the playbook is. I don't really know. Um, in terms of like what I would do in that situation, I mean, yeah, I mean, you, you, first of all, you need to be sure about your strategy, but I'm assuming in that hypothetical, the strategy is in place. Like you've chosen what strategy you want to pursue. And I'm assuming that you've got potential to scale like on a growth curve. So you are a startup. So that means like, that really does mean that you need to raise, um, venture capital and you need to build a team um that can help you scale uh and that might not be in your current skill set so that that's but that's not that's not um specific that kind of situation isn't specific to palestine obviously uh th but that being said you don't really have the traditional tools that, that we might have here in north america to like make that make that leap there's no question um so i i i think you've got to be determined i think you've got to uh like, I think you can easily talk yourself out of it, but, but just go for it. I mean, that's being daring and being like, um, you know, taking the initiative and, and getting out there. Like I said, why don't you tr like try uh, just like, even with VCs, like even in, in the best kind of scenario, like you're going to have to like appeal to a hundred of them and connect with them. And it, you know, before you might get one uh, opportunity and then maybe hopefully one, uh, follow on meeting or what have you. So it's not, it's not going to be easy, but I guess you, you've got to, you got to go for it. Um, yeah. And I guess like the other, the other opportunity might be, um, I think like a big opportunity is for us, uh, Rafa is to, um, help bring those resources to the table. So not just, not just bemoan the fact that they don't exist and there's no pathway, but like there's a, a vast diaspora of like successful Palestinian, Americans and Palestinians in the European Union and elsewhere in, in South America and around the world. Um, uh, so, so let's connect with them and let's help to mobilize uh, them to, uh, to contribute, right. To give back because they, I, I've never met a Palestinian Canadian that, that doesn't like care deeply about what's happening in Gaza, what's happening in the West bank, what's happening in the refugee camps uh, in Lebanon and, and elsewhere. Um, Hopefully that that's a lifelong commitment, but we but we haven't organized it uh, appropriately. Yeah. So totally so agree. no, I don't think there's any easy path. I think you might end up being stuck with what we might call here a zombie company, which sounds pejorative, but it's not. It's just a company that is doing well and uh, is like is going to carry on and create more value and grow, but it'll be incremental. It won't be hockey stick growth, and uh, and that's. Like, wh where do you go? That's like a, a, a strange, a good, but strange place to be. Um, and there's no easy answers for that, I don't think. Definitely. I mean, I totally agree with you. I, and I believe this is one of the reasons why we've actually launched Startup Grind Gaza, exactly. and Startup Palestine, Riable, and, and, and other initiatives. And it's really like people like you, John, like who are doing a great job and, you know, uh, lobbying the community and actually pinpointing areas of, of further development and areas of, of further like opportunities that should be followed that are making the difference. Uh, nevertheless, I mean, if the, all these efforts are still scattered, no real value will come through. So definitely the answer is, is via supporting the entrepreneurs and for entrepreneurs themselves to be actually daring and, and, you know, go the extra mile. And really, I mean, we're living under the, no question we're living under one of the, the toughest business environments. So 
what gives? I'm mean, just just try it out. If it works, it does. Yeah. If it doesn't work, like maybe they should try again. So uh, that's, I agree, that's and the... and and we can take we can take some uh, insights from like lean startup methodology and be heuristic. Like try to experiment in the shortest cycle, shortest least expensive cycle possible. Um, but you can. What, it's really about like getting moving and creating value and like just trying it out. Because if you don't do that you know, you're, you're stuck at zero, but if you can get over like the inertial state, like you don't know what will happen. And my experience, like with the startups I've been a part of, which is like Zumal, um, they innovate or India, which was a game dev startup here out of like a startup weekend event, similar to what we're doing now. Um, it's like, you don't know what'll happen until you get into business. And if you weren't in business, you weren't there Definitely. to like take advantage of the serendipity of it all. Uh, so I think it's it can be an exciting thing to, to get going just quickly. Obviously there are Middle East focused VP, uh, VCs like Middle East venture partners and so on. So like you guys should have like a, a list of who you're going to hit up and you would want to include the regional funds as well. And then also that like, there's, you know, like rival there's like, I'm seeing other like interesting platforms emerging. Like one, another one is grow home, like, which we could give a shout out to, uh, which I've, I'm just learning about now, but it's got some pretty cool stories. Like, about um, tech companies and tech startups and, uh, and connecting up the Palestinian uh, broader community uh, to what's happening right. on the ground. So let's, let's like force adding and keep it moving. Definitely, definitely. Hopefully we'll have a list of resources also at, at the page. Uh, time is running really fast and I really enjoyed my time with you, John. Uh, one, if you have like less than one minute to give like, you know, a last, uh, last thoughts uh for for our followers and and at uh, and and guests here um and uh, then we'll say goodbye yeah i mean i like i i'm really optimistic and motivated and excited about entrepreneurship and i think it's incredible principally as a like i said a creative force that's intrinsically about solving big problems and doing good things in the world uh it's like a tech for good kind of approach but i don't want to be naive about it because often it gets co-opted and structured and or subverted in ways, and we have to be uh, honest about that. Also, we've got to be honest about like how hard it is. So, you know, if you're considering entrepreneurship, you have to realize this is going to be a tough, tough thing. The entrepreneurs I've, I've worked with over the last, I would say, almost 15 years have been like they sacrifice so much. They work like unending hours. They hardly sleep. They, you know, have they, they bear like a huge mental burden, a burden on their families. They usually defer their salaries, like as founders, for many, many years. And it's kind of strange, right? Because they're also diluted if they're successful. If they're not, they have to go get a job. And if they are diluted, um, like the company becomes successful by the time there's a liquidity event or an exit opportunity, what, what they, how they participate in that upside is often if you prorate it over the course of eight years of their like effort to build up this company, it can often turn out to be that amount while it seems like a lot if you divide it by 10 or eight years or what have you it's not sometimes even equivalent to like the average salary they could have commanded and i often remember like corp talking to corporate recruiters here from like telcos telecommunication companies and they're like they often tell the story to like the brightest entrepreneurial minds that they meet tech entrepreneur potential tech entrepreneurs and they they push them out of the entrepreneurship pathway to get them to join their like innovation arm of the business yeah. You know, because they can offer them better uh, compensation and, and benefits. So there's sure. so many perversities involved in this and so much. It's so difficult. It can be so hellish. But that's also what kind of makes it like a fun adventure and something really exciting. And and uh, like, I think if you're going to do it, you, you, it's it's going to be an intrinsic motivation, like I said. And uh, like, go for it and see what happens. Definitely. Definitely. Okay. Thank you actually one minute over time so hopefully uh, okay. this was a great uh, no no sure I, I mean i really enjoyed my time with you john uh, i'm sure that our audience has enjoyed it as well and it will be live on our channel uh thanks again john for your insights and and your value added and we'll be in touch uh, shout out for our community i mean if anybody would love to get in touch directly with john just hit us an email or uh, connect with us and we'll uh, get you uh, introduced and link you together. Uh, John, my friend, thanks for your time today and uh, we'll speak soon. Ya Rafiki. Okay.